You're very welcome. It's Friday evening and it's the bank holiday. It's the August bank holiday. And I'll tell you, sometimes there's something crucial about August. You know, it's the last turning of a new month. The next one will be September. So so this is the last time you can, you know, be thinking there's part of the holiday ahead of you. I think that's why people leave their holidays until August, you know. It's the last chance to say this is summer. And so you become more precious about it. You, you, you want to... You want to enjoy it more intensely, I think. You know, you, you can be in the start of May, or even June, or even midsummer, and maybe the weather isn't so good, or maybe you haven't organised the family to come together, but it doesn't really matter intensely because you say to yourself, well, now there's plenty of time left, you know, the summer is still ahead of us. Well, when it comes to the August bank holiday, there's not too much time left. And so the intensity with which you find you want to enjoy it becomes bigger. And of course, if you're ever trying to enjoy yourself, trying, you know, making an effort to enjoy yourself, you're always liable to go over the cliff and make a mess of it. Because the thing about enjoyment is it, it, you can't actually grip it. There's so many ways people try and grip the pleasure of I'm enjoying myself. And you put an effort into going some. I mean, I, I went... We went one time to oh, a Mediterranean holiday resort and it was a nightmare. And the effort we put into it, financially, you know. And you got there and you were lying. I was lying on a sun bed. And I was just lying there asking myself, what did I do this for? And yet I, I'd still keep going to the sunbed every morning because I felt, well, you know, we're paying for it. I have to enjoy myself. And in the afternoons or in the evening, we would take a walk. And there was nowhere to walk. It was a holiday resort. I won't say where it is because I might upset you. You might be in it. But there was nothing to see. I mean, there was... There was just more holiday makers, more white people with burned bodies, and then, you know, some people with, with bodies turned into like that cadaver kind of flesh, which is sort of brown and dead looking, frightening you. And everybody's walking around, and wh what is there to see? One stall after another of leather handbags and rucksacks. And, you know, bags, man bags. That was all. And belts. And summer hats. With the name of the holiday resort on the baseball cap. And still I was going round them every evening. Forcing myself to enjoy myself. And then you'd go looking for a bar and a place to eat. And they were all right, but I mean, they were just, you know, simple, quick places for pizza, Italian food, Mexican food, whatever. And they were as good as you'd get in, in Carrick and Shannon. No better. Many of them not as good. And still you'd sit down and you'd drink a bottle of wine and you'd be there telling yourself I have to enjoy myself you know because it was like we invested too much in it the price of the plane and the price of the hotel and the 
the expensive dinners and the expensive drink. So you'd say, well, I better enjoy it. But deep down, oh God, I wasn't enjoying it at all. And I think the same thing used to happen to me years ago with uh, the August bank holiday because it, it, it is such a, like, a last call. Last orders now, please. This is the August bank holiday. You better enjoy yourself. And there's another thing that happened to me with, the, with August bank holiday. It tended, in the old days when we were younger, it, it tended to be a time where you would invite people for the weekend or for for an evening, you know, maybe Saturday for a barbecue, and then people would stay over. And sometimes it would be uh, people who had children the same age as ours, and they'd run around and we'd all have a party and all enjoy ourselves, and people would sort of fall into beds as the evening moved towards dawn. And they were great times. So that the week before, the week before that event, I would spend hours in the garden getting everything looking well. And I would obviously take the lawnmower to the the main area. You could call it a lawn, I suppose, even though, you know, it's a country area in Leitrim. But we'd, I'd cut it back tight and then... I would take the strimmer at all the areas where those big, you know, the dock leaves would have grown up and they'd be kind of torn into seed and there'd be nettles coming in different corners and there'd be brambles crawling out of the ditches. And you would take the strimmer to all that and you'd be really working at tidying up the place. And to be fair, there were times when the place looked gorgeous, you know. Um with big trees you know they're they're big big trees 20 foot 30 foot high gorgeous little you know corners of the woodland where you can sit and you'd have the lawns done and the whole thing would look splendid and you'd get the barbecue machine out on the patio and you'd be just well set for whether it was family or friends, relations, whatever. And you'd have a great old time, and that would be fairly intense as the August bank holiday. And what happened this year, because I'm here uh, on my own at the moment, what happened was I went out into the garden yesterday. Now, I've had a couple of illnesses which has kept me out of the garden. But yesterday I got back into it and I was enjoying myself with a little lawnmower. It's not, a, it's not even a big lawnmower. But I was amazed at how well it was cutting and I was amazed at my physical energy using it because I felt there was a couple of years where I was kind of going downhill and I used to always feel exhausted from any little bit of garden work. But then, you see, I had a heart attack, so I didn't realise the heart attack was coming. And now things seem to be much better, the energy very good. So there I was, doing the garden, and then I got this strange high, because I've always got excited. When I go into the garden, I remember all the big trees when there were little baby trees. And I remember when I planted them. And I remember sometimes who gave them to me. I have, I have a white rose bush. It's a wild rose. I got it from Bernard Lachlan. He was the director in the Tarun Guthrie Centre in Annamacarrick. And he's passed away since. Passed away. He had an accident in his home in the Pyrenees. And that was very tragic two years ago. But but there the the white rose that he gave me is still blooming. And there's another rose I have. Sometimes I used to plant a tree to commemorate somebody, you know. So for example there was a there was a Buddhist monk stayed here one time with us, his name was Lawang, Geshe Lawang. You'd still get him on Facebook, he's over in Mongolia. Um very wise man and a good teacher. 
but he was he was young at the time and he was so energetic and he was so wise and and he cooked for about a week for us and um to commemorate the visit i remember we planted a yew tree and that yew tree now is about 20 foot high it's mighty and there's a little rose bush that i i planted when the daughter was about seven years of age and so i called the the rose bush after her and so when i go round the garden mowing with the lawnmower i'm going into nooks and crannies where there's little trees big trees now huge trees i'm going around the trunks of them and i'm remembering all the moments when i planted those trees and i'm also remembering moments sometimes i come to a little corner of the garden that i actually haven't been in for a, a, a year or two and it's a little corner maybe where something happened you know there was a horse we had a horse in the garden at one stage and he used to enjoy sitting uh, or standing rather underneath the beech trees and for some mad reason we had put a delf statue of the virgin mary in one of the trees and over the years, the, the colours, you know, the blue and the gold of the statue wore off. And we wanted this to happen. So it became weathered and it, re- it returned to its kind of raw, original white chalk porcelain. And it looked kind of very ancient and very beautiful in the tree. It, it kind of grew into the tree. It was lodged between, you know, there was a kind of a fork in the trunk of the tree and it lodged in there and it was like a shrine in the garden and it was very attractive and it was precious and we had this piebald horse one time now it was the daughter's horse and she wanted to leave it here because she had nowhere to keep it herself in Donegal at the time and one day he took his back foot to the Virgin Mary and made smithereens of her. And we, we weren't upset or anything, it was a laugh. That's the way I would feel about religious icons, you know. I wouldn't be precious in a serious way about them. You know, they, they're manifestations of something beautiful, something transcendent. They come and go. I like the Buddhist idea of the wishing jewel. You know, a wishing jewel is like in Tibetan Buddhism, it's like something that appears. And and it can give you, bring you good fortune. It's auspicious. It's a good sign. And to some extent, Christian icons are similar to that. You know, they're, they're auspicious. They appear. They always appear. You don't go and get an icon. The icon appears. There may be a proximate way that it appeared. You know, you, it might be that a friend sent you an icon. It might be that a friend brought you an icon. It might be that your beloved, like my beloved, brought me an icon. So there's a mundane and ordinary reason why a sacred object gets into your possession. But the poetic way of looking at it and in a sense, the the deepest way of looking at it is that it appears in your life and it calls you to focus in a certain way on reality. And that is very auspicious. And that's what the icon does. That's what the, the porcelain figure was doing. Again, I'll tell you how she appeared, that particular statue... It, it actually belonged to an uncle of mine who was devout, a devout man, big in his prayers. Oliver was his name. And um, in the way that the bric-a-brac of somebody when they're deceased ends up in boxes and then boxes end up travelling to some relation and then you're poking through these boxes. And that's the way it was because he had a lot of good Irish books and... So I says, when they were divvying up some of the stuff in the house after he'd passed away, 
people said, do you want them Irish books? And I said, I'd love them, yeah. And they were all thrown into two or three boxes. Good books now, I still have them. Uh, really, really some of the best classic Irish language books from the 20th century. Cray and Nikilla and books by Liam O'Flaherty and McGreen and all the rest of it. Well, anyway, sure enough, in the boxes, in one of the boxes was the Virgin Mary. And I took her out and then she was in a shed for a long time. And she was so old-fashioned, like it was one of those statues that's so old-fashioned, you know, that they were very unfashionable there for about 30 years. You wouldn't be seen with one of them, right? The only place you'd see them would be in films about, you know, sorry, you know, oppression. You, you know, to become a symbol of, of oppressive Ireland, Catholic Ireland. You'd be watching a documentary maybe on the telly or prime time or something and they'd, have a, they'd be doing a, a, you know, a kind of a section on maybe the oppression of the church and, and the tyranny of clergy or something and it all would start with the Virgin Mary and be real old porcelain statue and the reason I suppose is because fairly, rightly, people were saying that the kind of template of Mary as porcelain and non-sexual and non-emotional and just like, this was a template that was being foisted on young girls, teenagers in Ireland for many decades and it was wrong I mean it was a kind of a a repressed kind of image of what you should be as a, a young woman. So that's all changed, and I suppose I feel a little bit more comfortable taking out the Virgin Mary. She was in a shed for a long time, and I felt not the right place for a sacred object. And one day, magically, it wasn't me, it was somebody happened to be here, and they just, do you know the way somebody does something intuitively, and it's always the right thing to do. You know? Somebody said, oh, look at that. And they lifted it up, the statue. And they went down into the garden and put it in the tree. A fork that was in the trunk of the tree, so they were able to lodge it in between the two. And I thought, that is perfect. That's where she should be. And as the blue faded and the colours faded and the kind of shine went off it and it became more... Just a white figure. It was beautiful. And you would pass it in the winter time or in the summer time. And it would call you to focus on the world around you in a different way. There's there's a there's a beautiful thing about about Mary, the mother, you know, in the Christian tradition. The kind of connection that you can have with her is it's like it's a motherly connection. It's very intimate, you know. Like you can wake up in the morning and, and say prayers, right? You could say prayers now. In Islam you could get up very early in the morning there and, and you'd be doing your your prayers. In Islam it would be, you know, acknowledging I testify that there is no God but the God. There's no God but Allah. And that Muhammad is his servant. And that's the truth. One God. And you could do that in the morning and it would it, it, it would bring you into a way of looking at the world that would be enriching. At least that's my experience. Believe it or not, you could you you know Islam means surrender. You wake up in the morning and you say, I testify that there is no God but the God, Allah. This is the God of Abraham now that Islam speaks of. This is the God of Moses and it's the God of Jesus. It's just God. It's just the same idea as if if you take it from the ground up, it's saying that, you know, everything, all reality is on fire, is alive with the presence of God. It's saying that at the surface level, there is what we see, and at the depth, at the depth of experience, there is that which is invisible and transcendent, and yet 
we can sense that presence. Okay, so then Islam is, is acknowledging that early in the morning. And then five times a day, four more times. Now that's the start of surrender, which is Islam to surrender. And it's a hundred percent a magnificent place to start. Or, or as a way to address life. But if you think about the difference, and the difference between Christianity and Islam, it is that in Islam, the essentialist about that whole single beautiful, powerful idea, God is the ground of all being. They don't buy into icons, images, uh, or or kind of prayer to other people or anybody else but God. It's just one thing. It's just one single thing. God. In Islam, they say, everywhere I look, I see the face of God. So I look out the window and I see this magnificent wild rose. It's it's purple, but it's a wild rose. It grows a big rose hip in the autumn. I don't know the name of it. It's a very famous one. You'd see it all over the country. And it's just like so magnificent in its architecture and in its colour. And I'm looking out on it. Now I can see it as it is, as a surface experience, and I can think about it scientifically. But there's a, a powerful enrichment when I say that everywhere I look I see the face of God, and so, wow, now what am I looking at, you know? I'm looking at beauty in nature, and I'm kind of opening my heart to it being the surface something very deep and invisible that I cannot actually access but I kind of feel it's there as a presence it's very magnificent the presence unnameable and yet I can sense it I can sense I have a relationship with it it's the same way with the mountain or the lake or the tree, the ash tree down at the end of the garden and it's starting to grow the berries now, they're not fully red yet. They're kind of orangey amber. But by God, they're growing in big bunches of them. And everywhere I look, I see the face of God. So I'm not just taking it at the surface level. I'm dealing with a sense of presence and otherness in the rose and in the ash and in the mountain and of course in human beings and the great master of that as far as I know is Martin Buber if you ever want to read a great book called I Thou or just look him up on YouTube and gonna get stuff about him Martin Buber I Thou it's like talking about the relationship between me and the rose, me and the ash tree, me and the mountain, me and the lake, and thinking about it in terms of the otherness, the presence, the depth that is out there, that is the other. Which is the start of all reverence, start of all faith. The nature of faith is really just the dynamic between me and the other. That's all. That's all. It's embodying the relationship in poetry. And that's one of the things about Islam which is magnificent, is that singularity of that huge idea. The thouness, the otherness. I testify that there is no God but the God. And they say the God, you know, Allah, the God. Because it's the God, it's definite articles. It's the God, it's just, you know, there isn't. And there is no God but the God. That's no, by no God they mean 
everything like all the things you serve you know the desires for money power fame whatever and everything that we make into gods they say no there's no god but god and they also have a way beautiful beautiful thing in islam is is the way that the the relationship between you and god is the complete truth you know it's 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 there's nothing else more true and more natural so so god is already in you with you you are god you are the manifestation of god it's a great liberative thing about islam that sense that you know if i walk towards god god runs towards me the intensity with which god is embracing you that's a big a big idea in islam he's closer to you they say than your jugular and that's why when somebody becomes muslim when they choose to be islamic to surrender to god they don't talk about it as converting to islam they talk about it as reverting to islam because there's a sense that everybody is islam everybody their natural state is surrender to god that's the whole color and music of the universe we are here to experience the sublime bliss of surrender to god in every moment and my teacher who's a young man in islam i have an islamic teacher i haven't seen him for a while because i do be in donegal but anyway he's a wonderful wise young man and he one time explained to me the nature of the soul and to explain the nature of the soul to me he got there was you know the tape that is around briquettes that green tape around briquettes won't be there much longer because they're all were at the end of that road i think but he got the green tape it was lying on the floor beside the stove where i had you know had used briquettes on the stove and the, the green binding tape was was lying there and he took it up and he says this is the soul right and then he made a knot in the in the the binder and he said this this is uh education and then he made another knot he said this is sex and then he made another knot and this is, he said this is ego another knot he said this is and he went on and on making these knots in the the binder the tape and each knot he made he 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 said this is you know part of what we would think our core self and he made one knot and he said this is religion this is religion is a knot so so then he unwound them and it was like he was saying now this is the soul so how do you get to your soul is like you get rid of the knots you unknot yourself and when you loosen all the knots there is no knot left now your soul is opening up and and that idea is also very close to to this sense that our natural state is belonging to god and so death can be seen not just as a release but as a very powerful release and awakening of the soul i i found that 
I remember the morning he gave me that teaching and I found it very, very helpful. And he was saying just let go of absolutely everything. Unknot yourself at every level and you will become really who you are. And I think that's pretty close to the principle to be here now. If, if you're gripping anything, let go of it. And I mean if you're gripping it with your mind. So one of the biggest things I found out in, in that conversation with him about Islam was, was the sense that Islam is this natural state, that the state of surrender is a natural state of being in relationship with the other who is God. And there's nothing else. There's nothing else. Everything else is just knots. All differentiation is just knots. That's a moment where Islam comes in touch with Buddhism in that sense of differentiation. Again, we sometimes think that differentiation is like sophistication. You know, if I'm able to differentiate between two different types of plant or two different types of food or two different types of human character, I'm, I'm really getting kind of really intelligent. And science in the West is knowing more and more about less and less. So we differentiate ad nauseum into the kind of very, very tiny little details of, you know, physics and molecules and quantums. And differentiation we would see as sophistication. Sophistication we'd see as enlightenment in the West. In Buddhism they would say that differentiation is the mistake. Once you start differentiating, once, once you lose the reality that, that there is just... You know, there is just singularity in being. And that even how you define yourself is a kind of differentiation. You're differ differentiating yourself from other people. Or in actual fact, we're much more interdependent. One, one thing. And, and that that is so close to a core idea in Islam. That, that you know, we're all knots. Our differentiation is like different knots, you know. And we, we grip the world through these knots. Like, even if I'm being religious and I'm, I'm clenching my fists because I'm thinking I have a sense of who I am religiously, then I need to get get rid of that knot. Everything in Islam is about returning. And it's about coming back to one idea. The God. Not your desires, not your... All the things that you might want to serve in life. Even good things you might want to serve. No, there's only one thing the God. And the door into that experience is to be here now. Do that five times a day, no matter what your religion, or even if you don't practice any religion, there's definitely a way that just being here now is opening that door and acknowledging that mystery. And that's what I'm talking about in these podcasts it's as simple as this that where mindfulness brings you to a threshold it brings you to a sense of stillness and awareness mindfulness only brings you to a threshold of faith and I'm talking about what happens when you activate that faith Being here now for me is that I-thou relationship where you're experiencing a sense of the presence. And that's, that is very, very Islamic. 
If you want to think about the most simple and beautiful idea in Islam, that's it. There is no God but the God. When my teacher, when I was in primary school, brother Timothy, used to say every hour, on the hour, a little bell would go on the hour, and there was a different person in the class who would be selected each day to lead the prayer, so that then every hour the bell would go, and we would say, let us remember that we are in the presence of God. And we'd, there'd be a silence for a few seconds, a few minutes, I don't know what it was, maybe a minute. And that was all. Nothing else. And I look back on it, and it's 50 more years ago, 60 years ago. Number one, it was such a, an Islamic prayer. It was so close to the way that a Muslim will pray five times a day, doing basically the very same thing. Becoming still and remembering that in this present moment, being here now, we're in the presence of the other. Even if you don't give it the name God, it doesn't matter. It's acknowledging that in your conscious being, in your embodied being, as you remain still, you're in the presence of the other. The other who loves you, who is carrying you through every dark moment. Out of that comes like joy, gratitude, relaxation, just a liberation to know that you're in the presence of God. And we had a teacher in, in primary school who taught us that and it must have made a huge effect on me because I've never forgotten it and I think it is the root of, of my obsession with this notion of being here now, of being present. I talk about being present to you and I am. Like you're present to me, I say this often, but you're present to me when I'm speaking. Beautiful evening here, as I said, the berries and the ash tree down at the end of the garden. What makes this really, really magnificent for me is that I'm talking to you. I'm sharing emotionally ideas and feelings today, particularly about Islam, but I'm sharing all this and it's like you are here. There's a time gap and there's a space gap and I may not even know who you are. But be assured that when you are present, you know, when you, when you come into the present moment, you're actually coming into eternity. You're coming into a space that is not time, time trapped. There's only one presence. There's only one being. And it's kind of like outside time holding holding up time, if you like. And you can slip into it. You can stop time and just be for a moment. You'll still be aware of the clock ticking. You'll be aware of your heart beating. You'll be aware of your breathing. And these things, becoming aware of them singularly, will help you. But you will experience consciousness in a way that you know, as you're experiencing it, that it's transcending that. Because it's watching. It's actually watching the clock. From a different dimension. And that being conscious, being present, being here now, hearing my voice and feeling that I'm present with you, that is one of the first wonderful things about the being here now, or the podcast. But the second is, that when I on my own here in this room, or you on your own, walking on the beach or the mountain, or sitting in your room or driving your car, or lying in bed, falling asleep, no matter where you are, 
The dynamic is you and the mysterious presence that you can experience when you pay attention. When you pay attention, be here now, pay attention. There is another, there is a presence. It, it wraps us up in love, gathers us like in a way that we feel we're home, we're safe. Our life has a meaning because this is the root of it. Surrender to that is to say there is no God but the God. No other thing in life that's worth clenching your fist about except God. And when you get there, You have an insight into Islam because that is really what Islam is. Which is why in, in many, many cultures for many, many centuries Islam has been a very, very open and tolerant system towards other religions. Because it sees the completion of everything in the prophecies of of Muhammad, but that embraces all the other Abraham, Moses, Jesus, everybody in that lineage, people of the book, people of faith, people of of the Abrahamic tradition, all one, founded on one single idea. You know the Rumi story about the elephant? The mystery of the elephant, everybody, there's seven people in the room and they're all in the dark and none of them can see and uh, there's an elephant in the room and they're all trying to figure out what is it. So each one of them has a different description because there's one fellow holding the tail and one fellow holding the trunk and one fellow holding the leg and one fellow holding an ear and they've all different descriptions but it's the one single thing, it's the elephant. That's a roomy story, and they, get, they talk about that story as like, you know, in some way, a kind of an idea about how different religions come at the one God in different ways, but they're just different ways of seeing it, different experiences. Well, the one that I experience is that, that in, in that Islamic way of thinking, you're dealing with one huge single idea, it, it really personalizes it. You get up in the morning, if the first prayer in your heart is is to surrender to that one God who is, who is everywhere, it's like, it's a very big idea. And so when I had that old-fashioned Virgin Mary stuck in the tree, And it got whiter and whiter as it aged. I revered it more and more as the years went by. And you would imagine then when the horse had been quartered under the tree and decided to give it a kick, you'd imagine that I might be annoyed. But I wasn't because... It was like she appeared, now she's gone. It was beautiful. I thought it wonderful that this fragmentation of the actual image happened, that it was shattered in bits. It was like it was like a way of telling me how transient everything is, including religion, including icons. Everything is transient. It's just intimately you and God. That is Islam. I can be here talking to you like this and I never see the inside of a church sometimes. Or a mosque or a synagogue or whatever. There's a kind of a freedom now whereby people are discovering faith and religion and in the heart, you know, people are going to it now internally rather than, 
necessarily being part of a, a club. Because the moment is always new. You are always new in the next moment. You're always born again every second, every moment. You're born again, right now. And that's really amazing. That's really astonishing. And if I look at the way that I... I'll tell you what happened this week with the the August Bank Holiday. I was in the garden, and I got the strimmer out. And I really wanted to get the whole place tidy and trimmed the way it used to be and I had the strimmer going and I was in big deep grass and the next minute I realised I had hit a frog and killed it I lacerated the poor frog and I was so shocked and so unhappy that I stopped the strimming I stopped it and I said, I'm not going to strim again. There was something terribly aggressive in me with the strimmer going through the long grass. And I says to myself, why did I do that? What, what was in me? I was clench-fisted about the August bank holiday. I was unconsciously being affected by the fact that years ago we would have friends staying here. We'd have children here. We'd have a good big barbecue. And there'd be all sorts of activity. And here I was, on my own, looking at the prospect that if myself and the beloved are together here or anywhere else for the August bank holiday, it's really just us. We're getting on in years. Other people get on with their lives. And we don't do as many of those kind of barbecues and garden parties as we used to. So we're getting old. And that was making me uneasy, and I was unconscious of it, so I was kind of working it out unconsciously. Which was a a bad result for the poor frog. But in another way, when I when I saw what I did to the frog and I realized I'm I'm getting too clench fisted about this bank holiday, I thought, relax, be here now. And I went up onto the patio and I sat down. And I says to myself, I'm going to devote this day just to being here now. I'm going to do my preparation for the August bank holiday. I'm going to get myself into a zone where I'm not wound up and I'm not clenching my fists and I'm not trying to have a good holiday. I'm not pushing myself to make everything work properly. I'm just going to really practice what you might call prayer, be here now, surrender, acknowledge the presence of the other one in the moment that you're in, practice it, practice it, let us remember we're in the presence of God, practice it, I says all that to myself, I had a cup of tea, and it might have taken an hour, but certainly after about an hour, I felt so much better. And I felt good all day, doing nothing except trying to be here now, in order to be able to enjoy August. Last month of the summer, in a way, last big moment that you can grasp the sense of summer and holiday, but don't grasp it. Pull back, be present, relax, enjoy every minute, every second as a moment to be present and then you will have a wonderful August bank holiday. Thank you for being here, enjoy the weekend, talk to you soon, bye bye.